I actually just finished doing a videotaped uh, deposition for eight hours about putting Napster on download.com at CNET and writing tutorials on how to use it. Um, so this is all very fresh in my mind. And in fact, the legal battles are still going. Oh, very much so, yeah. Um, so I think I thought you did a great job with the film. Um, it's, it's a massively important um, topic. You, you know, the internet only happened once. Peer to peer only showed up uh, for the first time once, mm -hmm. and they're both here with us forever. Um, what do you see as the relevance of the Napster story to today's technology? Um, well, I, I think a lot, uh, and I think that it, it's a funny thing because, in in some ways, it's late for a Napster story. And in a lot of ways, it's it's too early for a Napster story. Um, and I would sort of I feel more on the latter than I do in the former. Um, you know the 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 heart of what Fanning um, uh, innovated and disrupted, you know, in terms of his vision, uh, was about um, sort of looking at the internet as a place where everybody could be uh, communally connected, um, and that there would be a, a kind of a democratic flow of information. Um, and content, and all connected by people all over the world, um, and sort of like the idea, something that, that Google has dealt with um, subsequently, of, of sort of cataloging and indexing everything, so that you could, I mean, his, you know, the stuff that he was interested in mostly was, firstly, um, was the sort of social community aspect, and then the notion of being able to find things that were not freely and easily available. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that that strikes at the heart. Uh, that's what I found interesting about Fanning when I first met him uh, over 10 years ago. Uh, that's what I found interesting about, about Napster when I used it. Um, and, uh, and certainly those, I think, are, are the more prevalent issues that are facing us today, um, you know, in every corner of uh, the sort of the tech sector, whether it's, you know, uh, Google or YouTube, um, and sort of the issues around that, sort of the you know the, some of the battles that are being fought there with with Viacom, who, who paid for this movie by the way, um, and other people, um, and uh, all the way to Arab Spring and Bradley Manning and the NSA Snowden scandal and you know issues about uh, transparency, freedom of information, uh, internet rights. Um, you know, these are things uh, when Napster erupted in '99, and I got on onto it. You know, I'd gotten online in the late '80s. Um, and there was just such a, such a, it was so obviously a seismic shift. Um, it's such a big rock in the water, and it was clear in 99 that the world was never going to go back. So uh, we're still, as you said, dead in the middle, if not uh, actually in the infancy of the battles for the future that are happening right now. There's absolutely zero resolution in sight, as far as I can tell. Um, so that's why I think it's relevant. Yeah, um, I've, my favorite saying that I've coined about this, thank you very much, was uh, the, internet, the internet is a perfect tool for freedom or control. And it seems like uh, Napster was on the freedom uh, side of the equation for sure, and it just seemed incompatible with the control part that now seems to be happening sometimes on the internet. Yeah, and I, and I think that uh, something that's really uh, often overlooked about Napster, and I get this a lot because uh, I've been talking about this movie a lot since since we made it and went on the, on the road with it, you know, the very first question I was getting Q&As, I wouldn't get it at Google, um, but when I'm not dealing with technology people is, uh, oh, where can we download this movie for free? That's my last question. Yeah, and and it always makes me laugh, um, but it, it's sad because uh, it's, you know, my answer is, is very mundane in that, um, you know, it's, uh, Napster was never a piracy service and it wasn't, um, it wasn't created as a philosophical piracy service. So your, your question is interesting because, you know, to me, Napster sums up, uh, you know, the, sort of the duality of the internet in one company because they were not Pirate Bay. These weren't guys with an ethos, uh, and I'm thinking about Pirate Bay that I love, so it's not a pro or con thing. But these were not anarchists who were specifically out to create a decentralized system that would be unstoppable. Uh, quite the opposite. Uh, they intentionally created a centralized system um, knowing that in doing so, they had to have some uh, affiliations with businesses. They, had, they were not going to survive as a company, and they wanted to survive. They wanted to make money. They wanted to be a business. Um, if they couldn't do deals with the labels and, and the various interests that they were, whose content they were, they were moving around. 
Um, so here was a company that was both at once about freedom of the internet and also required a certain amount of control. And I think that because of that need, um, especially at that era of the internet, there was no way that they would ever have survived because they were trying to bridge the people that survived. Were people were like, say goodbye to control. You know, we're all about freedom, and you can basically kiss our backsides because we don't really want to do business with you, and you know, hopefully, we'll dismantle you. Right. So, um, so in your mind, after speaking to everybody, you know, interviewing everybody that you interviewed in the film, which is you know a huge breadth of of people, um, was it ever your impression that that the legal you know, so-called legal Napster um, that was a subscription service. Did that ever really stand a chance? Did anybody think that? Um, I know a lot of people very much did think that it would stand a chance because there were some very powerful business people uh, who were working tirelessly to make a subscription service. You know, did Fanning and Parker and, you know, Ali Idar and the, sort of the core Napster guys think, I mean, uh, you know, it's questionable. I don't want to make people angry in retrospect by saying what I think about that. But I think it's questionable. Um, I think that they realized by the time they got around, you know, uh, you know, because you have to remember that once you're injuncted, you, you can't innovate. You can't do any R&D. You can't do any work on the product at all. So um, they're, they were kind of baked in lucite at a certain point by the legal system. Uh, once that happened, a lot of them just felt like the game was up no matter what they did. And it went on like that for years. So I think they felt. I remember. I remember when I when I first met Fanning, as Napster was crumbling, and I said to him, "What was your favorite? What to you was the highest high you had on this whole process? When was the greatest moment?" And he said, "Everything was great till I hit sent, and uploaded the app." He goes, "Everything up till then was awesome." He <laughs> says, "From the moment he uploaded it, it, within a very short period of time, he realized that they were they were screwed." Right. Right. Um, and it's it is a shame that we can't. There still isn't really a great way to access all that stuff. I mean, the way that I used to use Napster, I would search for the same band. I would pretty much just search for Mogwai that I was really into, yeah. and then if anybody had them, I would know that anything else they had, I would be probably into that too. You know, nobody who just is only into Metallica is going to have a Mogwai song, and so it's like that was my litmus test. And then it's like, oh well, here's a live Mogwai show, and here's some band that's not even on a label that sounds like that. Um, Might have been an Explosions in the in the Sky song in that in that uh, in your movie. Um, so it, it seems like there just still isn't anything like that. And uh, what was it, 60 million users Napster had at some point? So Spotify right now, has, which is you know the the biggest on-demand subscription service, has not, nowhere, not not even half that um, worldwide in 2013. Um, I think SoundCloud has more users than that, but nobody makes any money from that. So, um, do you think that there's a a chance can copyright ever possibly be reformed to the point where there can be an all you can eat Napstery service that has all the gray area files. You know, I think that um, I don't think we have a choice. You know, I think that the sad truth of it is, I think a lot of people wish that a lot of things would go away. I think that there are people that wish that you know that the copyright that people would stop um, legislating against innovation on the one side. Um, I think on the other side, you know, there are certain you know sectors of the industry that just wish the internet would go away completely. You know, I think the reality of it is, is that um, we have no choice but to reform copyright. Now, frankly, in my opinion, copyright desperately needs to be reformed anyway. You know, it's Byzantine, and it's it's built around pre-existing systems that aren't even relevant anymore and haven't been for a very long time for the most part. So um, I think that, you know, we currently live in a world where neither the consumer or the artist is being well served. Um, so I think copyright law desperately needs to be reformed. And I think that... Um, you know, frankly, YouTube is the only example I can think of of, of a, an online service where you have a, a, an opportunity to find content that isn't freely available. That's the closest thing in a way to what Napster had. Um, and it's a searchable database. But, you know, the difference being, um, obviously, that, and this is, you know, all going to change and, and evolve, is that it doesn't yet have the curation cap um, component um, that Napster had in, in 98, 99, where it was very easy, like you just said about Mogwai, to drill down and find the stuff that you were looking for that led you to more stuff that you were looking for. Led you, it, was, it was kind of a, a fractal-like experience. I remember for me, because I'm a jazz fan, you know, I was immediately after you know, rare and unreleased jazz bootlegs. Right. That was my Napster thing. 
Um, and I was able to drill down and drill down and drill down and just find unbelievable stuff very, very, very quickly um, over dial-up. That does not exist right now in any service. It, but it's coming, and copyright notwithstanding, it's coming. So we have to reform the laws to catch up to the technology. I mean, as Ron Conway says in the movie, you can't stop the technology. You can't. You know? It's true. It's true. I mean, the, I view um, file sharing as kind of a, a pressure valve on the legal services. Like, if they don't get it right, everybody's going to go back um, to, to Napster and, and, of course, there's there's BitTorrent sitting there, and and uh, uh, some of these are still around. But it, I, you know, to me, it seems like really, um, it's it kind of uh, it's kind of worked as a pressure valve. I mean, I, would there be a Spotify had there never been a Napster? Um, let's let's maybe talk about this a little bit. So, um, in in your film, um, there's this idea that uh, I forget who said it, but you know, there's Napster led to Friendster, Friendster begat MySpace, MySpace begat. Uh, Facebook and, and Google Plus and everything else. Um, so do you buy that? Do you think Napster is like the granddaddy of all of these social services? Well, you know, I'm just a guy who made a movie. So sure, in my opinion, absolutely, because that's what I experienced, you know, in my, with my, you know, uh, relationship to technology. That was how it worked for me. Um, I can tell you that everybody that I know in the tech sector um, feels that way. Um, everybody that I've met, super high up the food chain in that world, all credit fanning with, you know, um, I mean, there are sort of grumbly, mumbly people who, you know, as competitive as, as everybody can be, are just like, oh, you know, obviously this would have happened at some point. It was coming. Um, but I think you can't, what you can't take away from those guys was the scale, of, with their ability to scale that uh, service, which had not been done before. Um, their ability to get it to 60 million users, their ability to move um, content around that quickly in the age of dial-up was, was radically innovative. And also the, the sheer disruptive nature of what Fanning and Parker put out there. Um, and you know, you can argue, I, made a, I went to great pains to not get bogged down in the, in the ethics discussions in the movie. Yeah, how do you respond to that? Oh. Um, because I, I feel very, very strongly that um, the, you know, the, the world that we live in, uh, you know, especially with the way the media works and the news media works in this day and age, it, it, things get very, very quickly uh, mythologized. And I think that once they do, you lose specificity completely. And to me, the Napster debate always being you know, focused around this notion of piracy versus, you know, artists' rights or the industry's rights was so specious and inaccurate and caused, I think, an extra 10 years of not understanding what was really going on. The fact that we're still in court arguing over various clauses of the DMCA in 2013 just says to me that nobody, for the most part, has any idea what the hell is actually going on, how to solve it, and I think it's 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 irresponsible to just keep creating this very buzzworthy debate about kids in baseball caps who want to steal shit, and you know the man who's trying to hold on to the product. I just don't think it, I think it's irrelevant, and I think that the reality of the world we're in is that the technology has happened. A lot of really innovative people are driving it forward. A lot of people are trying to stop it, and the fact is, is as you just said, it's going to evolve with or without this legislation. So the best thing we can possibly do is stop bickering about the ethics and go, guess what, guys? We live in this world now. Let's start working out ways of serving the consumer, the artist, and various people and, and getting the laws adjusted that we need to get adjusted rather than criminalizing people and pointing fingers at who may or may not be right or wrong for wanting to download something either for free or for less money than somebody wants it to be spent on. I just think it's, I just think it's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. So what... What do you think about um, artists? I mean, there there are a few that are. I guess Tom York is the most notable one, um, who are opting out of the you know quote unquote legal services that have sort of descended from Napster. I mean, Spotify uses peer to peer technology. Sean Parker's involved. It's free if you want it to be in the in the U.S. Um, and uh, what what what's your take on on artists that are just saying like, no, we don't want that either. Um, I think that all, I think in a way all of it's good. Like I have my own opinions about, about Tom York's response to Spotify that, that, you know, a lot of people like Bob Left Sets have responded to very articulately and that, you know, you can take it off Spotify yet it's still on YouTube. So it, it doesn't make a lot of sense from a technological standpoint. 
Um, I think that the argument that um, you know artists need to be fairly compensated is valuable. Um, I think it was valuable with the record industry before the technologies, and I think it's valuable in, in this new landscape we live in. I think people fighting for artists, I'm an artist, people fighting for the rights of artists are good people. Um, so I think that, you know, again, I'm really against sort of like creating black and white out of gray. Um, so I think we live in a world of gray. I think that, you know, people are going, okay, so you're innovating over there, Spotify. Well, you know, that's cool, but we don't like X, Y, and Z. So Spotify can respond and maybe fix some aspect of X, Y, and Z. So I think this sort of democratization of these sort of evolutionary technologies to the degree that they can be democratic um, is a good thing. It's right. better than shutting people up. I don't always agree with them, but I'm like, I'm happy for someone to heckle someone who's trying to build something. You might make them build a better mousetrap. Well, that's a very mature way of looking at it. I think back then, everybody yeah, I'm was old. like... Every, <laughs> I guess we all are a little bit more than, than back then, because it really was a black and white thing. It was like for us or against us and very ideological. And I, I think it's, it is helpful that, that a lot of people have gotten past that. And, uh, you know, I got a press release the other day about, um, I guess you can now back up your phone using peer-to-peer -peer technology to your own computer, like you're your own peer and somehow bounce it around in... Uh, secure packets or something. And anyway, I mean, it, it seems like now there are, it, it's coming out that there are many, many legitimate uses for this technology as I recounted at length during my recent videotape deposition. <laughs> <laughs> um, so shifting gears a bit, um, can you walk, well, first let me let me go here. Um, I, I talked to, a, we had a 16 year old intern where I work and he's coming from a very different place um, you know, he's what they call it in your film, a digital native, I guess. Uh, and he said that uh, when he's assigned work in school, you know, to read something that literally nobody actually reads the book anymore. I mean, even with Shakespeare or something, it's like, <clears throat> it, it wasn't even Cliff Notes, or a Spark Notes or something is what they're all using now. Um, and uh, his question to me was like, what are you going to do? How are you going to write long form stuff to people like me who are never going to read it? And I was like, mm, yikes. Um, do you see the documentary or the, the video form as the new long form journalism? Or is this how more complicated information is going to be relayed? I don't. I honestly don't. I, I really, really don't. I don't see. And I've got three kids and, you know, and they've all been, you know, my three year old will sit in front of a magazine and try to move the screen like it's an iPad. You know, so I get that the world is changing. Um, but, I, you know, I've been saying this for years uh, within, like, my own content unions, you know, that I'm in, you know, four different unions. And, and you know, I, there's a sky is falling mentality that I just think is so um, completely erroneous. And I think that, yeah, you know, change hurts some people. Um, innovation causes disruptions, which causes certain aspects of our lives to change. But, you know, if there's one thing we've learned in the last 150 years of, of massive accelerated change is there's room for many different types of people and many different platforms. And, you know, the radio is going to kill the newspaper and the movie was going to kill the radio and TV was going to kill the movie industry. And, do you know, the video, Betamax was going to kill the movies and downloading music was going to kill the music industry. And it's, it's all nonsense. And it just keeps getting proven over and over and over again to be nonsense. But it's, but people, you know, it's like one more person talking about how, why write novels anymore? It's like people read, you know, go on the subway, people are reading novels. You know, my, my kid who's, who's 14, 15 is a voracious novel reader. He can, mo he reads novels faster than I do. He reads all of them. You know what I mean? Right. So I don't think it's going away. I think that 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 you you know the world's filled with people. There's lots of people in this world, and there are many different types of people in the world, and they like consuming their stuff in different ways. And you got your this one kid who's like you know maybe he's got ADD. I don't know, but you know he doesn't want to read anything that's long. Um, I don't either, and I'm old guy. You know what I mean? So I may be more like him by nature, and the technologies are serving me in many ways that I like. You know because I am like a fast. I do like doing a lot of different things at once as opposed to, but I think it's a temperament issue. And I just think the world we live in now offers you that many more outlets for consuming whatever culture you want, however you want. I think that the fact that print media is beginning to respond to these changes as well as they have, when everyone thought they'd be the first place to go under, like completely, like why the hell would you ever read a newspaper again? Well, people are, 
reading them in right. various forms. Well, there you go with that nuanced viewpoint again, where it's not one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I actually yeah. think, I mean, as a, as a writer, I think, you know, text does have its place. I think it's actually, in terms of the uh, information per minute, it doesn't do badly against uh, other, I mean, it depends what you're trying to present. Yeah. Um, about the documentary process, so, um, I mean, I think we can both agree that it's it's important, you know, whether or not it's going to replace long form, you know, other other long form information relay techniques. Um, so I'm sure there are people watching this that have had an idea to do a documentary about a phenomenon um, that that's important the way that, that Napster is and was. Um, what would be your advice to somebody who wants to, how, how does one go about doing this? You've got so many people on camera that were just right involved with this from the start. How do you, how do you do this? What do you do? Uh, you just keep. I'm sure it's really easy, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, like I said, I started working on this project in 02. I wrote it as a narrative for a major studio in 03 and 04. Uh, I wanted to turn around, which means it was just sitting in development and I walked away. Uh, and I came back to it in 09, and I decided to make it a doc because I felt like there were so many prevalent issues in, in Napster's story um, that would be better served having the original people talk about it than me putting words in their mouth as a narrative. Um, you know, the, the, the fact is, is that documentaries are in a golden age. Um, I think that, you know, they are because um, they can... Because and this is going to sound very buzzwordy, but they are like a multi-platform media. You know, uh, for instance, with downloaded, we are our distribution rollout is like theatrical, di like nine different types of digital. You know, streaming, free streaming, you know, ad aggregated streaming, you know, downloadable, whatever on all these portals. It, they they're a good sort of present day piece of content. Um, they are hard to get made because they're hard to monetize. I mean, documentaries are tough to monetize, so you have to really find people who just want to tell the story and get the story out there. But they exist, and there are more of them now than there ever have been. I mean, there is, there is, you know, for all the fetching people do in my industry about how, you know, how much worse things are now, there's way more opportunity now than there ever was in terms of the amount of buyers and the amount of, of sort of content distribution networks. I mean, there's there's more popping up every day via the net, via, you know, conventional TV or whatever. So I think you have a good, if you have an interesting enough idea and you're willing to stick with it, I think you have a good chance of getting something made. The other beauty about a doc is you can just make it. True. I mean, you True. could just make it and then distribute it yourself or, or you know, build into the, the you know, the, the structure of it later with the financing. That's an interesting way to do it. Sort of a cart before the wagon, but who cares? The cart In this day and age, I mean, that's it. There's horse. no cart or wagon anymore. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> yeah. I meant, yeah. I meant horse cart, but yeah, yeah, I take your point. Yeah. Um, so I had an interesting day uh, around this whole time that the, that the film is about. Um, so I was sitting there at CNET, and there were a bunch of people from News.com, John Borland, who had a, had a story in here, um, and a bunch of other uh, reporters, and we had Hillary Rosen in the room from the RIAA um, right, I think, during the end of her tenure. And we grilled her for, I don't know, an hour or two hours, you know, 20 reporters all with, you know, recording things in her face. And, and she was very nice about it. Um, I was surprised that she didn't actually breathe fire after everything I'd heard about her. Um, but, you know, so we all peppered her with questions forever. And then at the end of it, she goes, now I have one question for all of you. You know, um, what, would you, what would you do if you were me? And we're like, oh, gosh. I mean, uh, so she's in between, you know, she's got the labels going after her um, on one side. And then she's got, like, the entire internet mocking her on the other side. And uh, I think in your film she comes off as, as kind of agreeable. But um, what's what would you have done? if you, Say that you're Hillary Rosen around this time. What, what do you do? Well, if I'm Hillary Rosen and I'm working for, you know, a trade organization that represents... Um, you know, an industry that's that's in a battle, um, and I'm being paid handsomely by that trade organization. I fight for my trade organization, or I leave. And um, I mean, I don't mean to be glib. I think yeah. you know the the facts speak for themselves. She left eventually. She did, and and she so, left. You know, notably before they um, started suing actual fans. I think I she think. left specifically um, before they started suing individual fans. And and I think that that you know. Um, I think that they I think they're all in a very tough position. I think that the labels are in a tough position. I think that, you know, um, you know, the RIA is still in a tough position. I think that 
you know, the, you know, it's the one thing I'm not, you know, I'm certainly gray, but I'm not cavalier. Like, I don't think, you know, it's, it's, there's two things that happen, you know, in, in any kind of revolution like this, whether it's cultural or political, you know, it's, it's sexier to side with the new guys. You know what I mean? Right. So it's, uh, and it's, you feel like the winner if you side with the new guys. So I think, you know, psychologically, I always kind of try to tug against that inclination, you know, within myself um, to just go, yeah, this is cool and it's new. So I'm just going to side with this. I think that, that, you know, there are things that have to get worked out. Um, and I think that it is inc incumbent upon, you know, the new leaders in the space, which is predominantly Google, to be completely honest, um, at this point in time, um, to really, you know, very carefully navigate this terrain. I don't think it's easy for them. I don't think it's easy for the pre-existing businesses. I don't think it's easy for the artists. To some degree, I don't think it's easy for the consumer because they're going, Jesus, am I a criminal if I do this? Am I actually breaking the law? But I want to do it, and everyone's telling me to do it, and it's definitely more convenient and a better system than this creaky old one they're trying to bend me to go back into. So I think everyone faces, you know, um, I would say that we're all Hillary Rose. I think everybody's facing these very tough, uh, choices right now, every day, you know. Um, I think that that what's really interesting. I mean, not to try to, to to elevate the Napster story beyond where I think it deserves to go, but I think it's there's a there's a correlative between. I mean, look at what's going on with with the Syria decision. You know, you now have the democratization of information to a, to a degree that you've never had it before. Where, so you've got the government saying, "Oh no no no, we got to do this," and everyone's behind us, and everyone's going, "Well no, we're not." Now, in the past, you wouldn't hear everybody saying no or not. There'd be no way to hear that voice other than at the water cooler. Now we know that there are tens of millions of people out there via social media saying, well, actually, no, we don't really want to bomb Syria. Now that puts, that now Obama's Hillary Rosen. You know what I mean? Everybody's now stuck in this position of just going, oh, crap. You know, how do we deal with the fact that on the one hand, we need to have control, and on the other hand, there is this, all of this freedom of information. Right. So it seems like uh, this was going to be one of my questions. You know, do you view peer to peer technology as inherently political? It sounds like yes. I think everything is inherently political because look how quickly the, the peer to peer issue became political. I mean, you know, I saw it coming in 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 99. Like, you know, to me and Fanning said it himself, the day I met him, he's like, Napster has nothing to do with music, you know, and I got that completely when I when I got on Napster It was like could have been anything. You know, the idea to move music around in a way was a delivery system for Sean because he knew that that was like the Pied Piper. That would get the kiddies to come to the party. The party is what mattered. The party was the end game, not the lore. So, it, of course, it was going to get political. And it got political very, very quickly. Indeed. Um, so... Um, I was one of these people who was a big believer in Snowcap and followed it all the way to its end. I forget who acquired it, and it kind of fizzled out. But um, this idea of a, of a you know universal database that knows what you know has audio fingerprints of music, and people can go claim that, and then other people know who owns it, or if nobody is claiming something. Um, I, I talked to a guy from the IFPI uh, who said he was working on something like that, like universal identifiers for songs so that people know what it is and what the rules are associated with it. And then the, he emailed me again, and he's like, I'm getting fired, and you can't, uh, I'm, I can't talk to you anymore. So Yeah, the um, NSA like showed up at his house and <laughs> dragged him away. Possibly, yeah, who knows? Yeah. Um, but uh, I don't know, do you have any hope that of something like this? I guess content ID on YouTube is, is is kind of like that, where it just knows, like, this song, the money goes to that guy, this song, nobody wants. Yeah, it. I think that what's what's interesting, you know, I remember I was I was hanging around with Fanning a lot when he was working on Snowcap. That was, like, predominantly when I was writing the movie the first time. So I was in the trenches on that and watched what he was, and it was amazing, the both the 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 courage that he had and you know and then he had Hillary Rosen on his board like I mean it was really an amazing turnabout from what he had dealt with before um, and that he had a lot of support from within the industry people that had villainized him were aware that he was actually trying to help solve the problems but it was just it was just brutal to watch because there was no way that um, there was it was just way too much too soon to try to do that and I think it's still too much I think that you know I think one or two things is going to happen I think actually both things are going to happen I think that companies like Google you know, uh, or U YouTube within Google 
are going to make, you know, and I already are making, I'm sure, behind closed doors, are going to just make humongous strides in this area because they already have their arms, like you were saying about Napster, they already have their arms around the community, which is the lion's share of the battle, is just getting your arms around the community and going, okay, we're all here in this one space. Well, we're all in YouTube. I mean, that's a fact. I mean, it's there's no comparison between their metrics and the next metrics down from YouTube. It like drops by like a billion or something ridiculous. Um, so all our arms are around that. So they've got a really good shot at, at, at driving a lot of reform because the numbers are there. But I think we also can't rule out, rule out the disruptive innovator who comes just clean out of left field, who comes like you're, the person you're talking about, who just comes up with a better mousetrap. And that's what's exciting to me about the, about the landscape that we live in, where you have that capability where someone could just come out of left field with a better mousetrap, and that would be great too. And you know, in this day and age, it would probably be acquired, and it would then be folded into a pre-existing system, and the world would be happily ever after. Right. Um, I should mention that, that we have microphones if anybody else has a question um, for Alex. Um, so here's, here's one. So. Um, Google Play All Access is not the only service that does this, but it's one of them where um, you can take MP3s you may or may not have gotten from Napster, you know, uh, over a decade ago, or from anywhere else for that matter, and upload them into um, a service that pays uh, copyright holders. You know, when you when you stream, you know, it's it's a legitimate service, and I, th I think uh, iTunes Match works that way, mm -hmm. sort of amnesty. Um, you know, welcoming, welcome back to paying for music, and you can still bring all that other stuff that you have, and we will just kind of not, uh, you know, well, it, it's fine. Oh, it's you're forgiven, you know, to to quote the the band in the in the movie. Um, <laughs> uh, do you think that uh, that the kids, I mean, that they really will, if you're if you've kind of grown up with free music at this point in various forms, um, is is it? Do you think that as kids grow up, they will uh, they will start to pay ten dollars a month for something that just gives them access to everything, including the stuff that they get elsewhere? You know, I get this asked this all the time, and I, I'm beginning to think that I must either be totally naive, or I don't know what. But I don't. I would understand that question in 2002, but in 2003, Steve Jobs proved the answer to that question. You know, which we knew in. I knew in 99, and the Napster guys knew in 99. And, and, you know, the guys that created the iTunes store all came from Napster. I mean, it's not even, you know, Jobs literally hired, I won't name names because it always gets me in trouble, but, I mean, he literally, you know, you could Google it. He hired this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy from Napster who had built the artist development, the iTunes store, the head executives over the the what became the iTunes store uh, at Apple. So, um you know, uh, people will pay for convenience. Of course they will. We, we learned that in 2003. They paid through the nose for convenience, and they continue to do that. So, you know, again, in my experience, we don't live in free, in free culture anymore. The free culture window was really, really short, and it was through necessity. We had a free culture window because when these technologies erupted, they erupted outside of the purview of the industry. So there was no way to buy this stuff. You could only download it for free. There was no way to use Napster and pay for it. They were desperately trying to catch up, play catch up, and make it a pay service because they weren't going to make any money if they didn't. They were using the model of like, here, take all this stuff. Like it was like a beta model. You know, take this stuff for free, and if you dig it, then we'll start charging for it. Well, they never got there. So iTunes did that. They made a fortune. They built the empire that is the new Apple, sort of Apple II, off the back of the of the fact that the public will pay. For this stuff. So my son, for instance, my elder son, he never grew up with free culture. He's always paid for content online. He didn't grow up during the downloading era. Yeah, I think people view it as a as a waste of disk space now. Like, why would I clog up my whole hard drive? Yeah, but even if you're working off the cloud, he'll pay for Pandora or he'll pay for, you know, and actually a lot of people like having stuff. Like my son specifically will be like, I don't want my stuff on the cloud because it gets lost or if, if my internet goes down, I can't listen to my music. You know, so he likes having stuff. Um, and you don't need, you know, drive space being what it is, and that's about to revolutionize anyway. That won't be as big of an issue. But still, you can keep an enormous amount of music on a thumb drive, and kids love doing it. I mean, he's got it on, a, on his phone, on his laptop. But he'll pay, you know. I mean, if they were literally, if he does everything on YouTube, if, if YouTube, and they're doing this with advertising, obviously, but if they literally turned around and started charging him a subscription fee for YouTube, he'd pay it. 
You guys hear that? Like that. I mean, honestly, he pays. He doesn't want to hear the ads on Pandora, so he pays for. You know, it's it's. I just don't believe we live in that culture anymore. I think that that. You know, I never really viewed the public as thieves. They they wanted convenience. They didn't want to steal. As soon as people started offering them services that were as convenient as the free services, they paid for them. Right. So um, Lars Ulrich features prominently in your film for obvious reasons. Um, and uh, I got to interview him, I don't know if it was two or three years ago at South by Southwest, under heavy security, by the way. I don't know if you dealt with that. Like, there's like the Metallica police or something. Um, <laughs> it's like Disneyland. They have their own police force. Yeah. It is really like death clock. You know? Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I just wondered, and so during that interview, he admitted to bit torrenting his own most uh, recent oh, album at the time. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Um, did you, from the artists that you talked to, did any of them sort of off camera um, tell you different things about about Napster? Was you there? You know, that happened all throughout Napster's history. There was always a duplicity be be between what was being said on camera and what was being said off camera. I mean, I did so much research when I first wrote the script, and almost all the artists that I talked to in those days used Napster and dug it but were really scared of their, their labels getting mad at them if they said anything pro. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I think you would still find that 10 years later, that a lot of artists wouldn't go on record you know, for fear of, of reprisal from their, their record labels. Um, I think that, that um, in Metallica's case, you, know, you were dealing with... Um, uh, you were dealing with, I would say to be fair to them, they were the front end of of the very beginning of people going, holy crap, what is this? Tech? Like, there's a tsunami. What is it? Can we just stop and figure out what it is? Which I think is actually, like, to, to be fair to, to Lars, um, is a justifiable and understandable perspective. I think what happened to Lars is that a lot of artists that may have been pro or con Napster or whatever, once they knew what it was, were like, oh, my God, what is this thing? And Lars went running out onto the battlefield thinking he had a whole army behind him and then turned around and everyone else was like, no, oh, I'm not getting involved yeah. in this. Well, they, yeah, they probably saw those cartoons where they... they yeah, exactly. And there he was, like, he, he stuck his neck out and, and nobody came to his, his aid. Um, but I think the reality of it is, 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 is that the artists that are, you know, you know, if you look at Dre, you look at Lars specifically, you know, Dre you know, was was certainly very uh, vocal against Napster, but it's not like he was a Luddite. I mean, look at how he's really, you know, primarily made his living for the last 10 years is through, primarily through digitally oriented headphone equipment and is now sort of driving forward beyond that into actual, you know, uh, sort of music-based subscription service technological, you know, hoo-ha that he's doing much off the you know, uh, off the model of Napster. So I don't think that these people were just like, no, we're never, ever, ever going to um, evolve with these technologies. I think that they were just completely blindsided by them um, and wanted to sort of stop and address these issues. Um, but the reality of it is, is you can't stop these technologies. You can't stop evolutionary technology. You can't. It's unstoppable. So you have to run with the train and make the reforms that you need to make. And I think people are still adverse to that. Right. Um, well, unless anybody else has questions, I'm now going to ask the inevitable one. Um, the one I probably can't answer. No, no, you can. Um, have people been file sharing your film, and have you seen that happen, and how do you feel about it? Oh, um, yeah, of course they have. You know, uh, as, soon as, as soon as we were available digitally within however long, it, you know, two hours after that, uh, we were DRM stripped and on Pirate Bay. Um, and you, at which point, you completely reversed your philosophy and started suing everybody, right? Um, yeah, yeah. I'm. Um, I think it's stealing content is fine unless it's mine. Is actually That's what, what the I conclusion thought, right? I've come to. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, no, I mean, you know, look. The the again, um, there is a lot of debate about this, and there's a lot of 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 emotionality around it. A lot of um, ignorance, I would say, and a lot of just really just hurt feelings, you know, too. I have a lot of friends who are musicians who are just bummed that the industry is not the same anymore. And I get it, you know, it's the industry, it isn't, and it never will be. We're never going to reset the clock and go back to the Tower Records era. It's never, ever, ever, ever going to happen. So, you know, I'm not 
callous about that. I think that there are things that we've lost that are a bummer, just like change. You know, the horse and buggy had its, you know, we didn't have as much pollution. So there's, you know, maybe more methane. Methane, yeah. I was going to say. Yeah. But, um, but, you know, there are, all, are always, you know, sacrifices when, when change occurs. Um, but I don't think that there are anybody, that there's anybody in sensible in positions of power anymore who doesn't realize the promotional value of torrenting. And I mean, I think I read an article yesterday where, you know, the guys at HBO are getting more vocal about, you know, the, even like the Game of Thrones thing, like they'd rather people didn't take it. But I think they're, I think that those people are becoming aware of what the reality is, which is as soon as we're able to match the convenience of these free services, people will pay for them. And I think that's just been shown over and over and over again. And you will always have some degree of pirates within that pie graph. It's a very small percentage. The bulk of the people on, when you're dealing with massive torrenting honestly are not getting it as conveniently as quickly in, in a more you know legitimate service. So yeah, people are, are downloading it. I think it's honestly for us on our level, it's just promotion. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're onto something there. It's sort of the it's the motivation for um, the industry to evolve in a way that that makes more sense for the fan or the consumer. Yeah, absolutely. And and what was it? What just got what just got leaked? Um, like today or yesterday, I was reading about it. Um, whatever, some new show or whatever got leaked, and they were and the response even that with that was like um, I think it was was it, was it the premiere of Homeland something like that. Um, was like, is it is really actually going to drive promotion? They were just at that point, you know. And, and you know, if you watch this historically, you know, it's sort of like you know the the uh, you know the witch trials. It used to be heretical to say this. You know, if you said this in public, you know, you were blacklisted. You know, how dare you say piracy is good? Um, and you know, when that when that kid got thrown in jail for a year for uploading the Wolverine movie. You know, and then subsequently, if you actually dig into it, you realize that it it did incredibly well for the movie right. <laughs> promotionally. And I think some poor suckers doing time. It's get, like this movie is so good that this guy went to jail for a year. It, exactly. You know. Um. You know. So I think that's like I think that people are beginning to realize. You know, two things. One is that a lot of that stuff just drives promotion, and you know, and the other is that that the public is are not inherently free culture people. Um, I think the idea of free culture is total mythology. I don't think we live in that world at all. And I think it just keeps getting proven over and over and over again that people will pay. Nicely done. Well, thank you very much, Alex Winter. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>